How's it going guys? This is John and this is the basic expert channel. You'll see that I have a new layout here. Just trying this out. I wanted to have a layout where I could talk to you. You could see my face. We could look at each other longingly, but then also show my screen. And when I talk about stuff, uh, I could show you guys that at the same time. So slightly new format, uh, format here. Um, not unusual for a lot of YouTubers to use this format. So shouldn't be anything drastically different. Tell me what you think in the video description about it. Before we get into the topic of this video today, I wanted to give a shout out to Pulp Hummock Press and their OSR mega dungeon called Gods of the Forbidden North. Uh, it is designed for old school centrals and is launched on Kickstarter. Go and check it out. It's going to be a 300 plus page book about uh, a mega dungeon with all new monsters inside it. So you're getting a mega dungeon that will take characters from levels 1 to 14 plus all new monsters essentially uh, probably a little mini monster manual in there and I think that's awesome the art looks fantastic I'm not paid to say this uh, they are my friend and I want to support their uh, project here so please go support them and check it out it would mean a lot to me and it mean a lot to them so please go check it out I also wanted to talk about Libra Art Online, which is the other thing that I do, which is Creative Commons art. So if you are a creator and you feel like I have an idea for a module or adventure, but I don't, I'm not good at art and I don't want to just use Creative Commons art or, or public domain art, I have some more modern looking art here that you can use. All you have to do is give me attribution. It is completely free. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider supporting me on uh, subscribe star, I almost said Patreon, I'm not using Patreon, those censoring a-holes can go shove it. Uh, subscri subscribe star here, it says three dollars, it's actually five, something's glitchy and screwed up here. But uh, for five dollars, you support Libra Art Online, and you also will get an adventure a month. Uh, the first adventure is already up here, the secret summoning my first one that is it's built for basic fantasy role playing but again because so many of the osrs are so cross compatible it should work for almost any fantasy based osr game that you are running that uses like old school dnd rules so please check that out it'll help me out a lot I, I would love to have more time to make more content instead of freelancing uh because the freelance game it's not fun this is fun um, so if, and I want to give you something in return for your support. So every month you will get an adventure with a, uh, virtual tabletop compatible map, which is what this one has. You'll get a PDF of the adventure every month at the start. Uh, I'm already working on the second one. So this one's kind of a little smaller. The second one is going to be a multi-level dungeon adventure for people in some ancient dwarven abandoned ruins, but they're not so abandoned, obviously. So please check that out. Uh, I also want to show my, di uh, not Discord, it is a Discord clone called Gilded. And Discord, as you know, is, has made some ridiculous sort of rules where they want to kind of govern what you say, do, think, and act like outside of using their service. And so I suggest just get off of Discord. Come on on Gilded. It's essentially the same exact thing. Uh, we have... Uh, chat here that you can get involved in. Everyone has a good time in here. It's a great place to talk about OSRs and tabletop role-playing games. So go check that out. So I wanted to talk about this tweet here and kind of it, it seems so common today to see this and, I, and I've heard horror stories from other game masters and DMs where players expect them to be like Matt Mercer or players are disappointed in themselves because they aren't as good as the cast of Critical Role or whatever their favorite um, live play game stream is and I want to come out right out of the bat right, right, right from the start and say it's okay if your game doesn't look like that the, nobody's it's very rare for anyone's game in real life to look like Critical Role or any of these overproduced sort of actual play um, games. And I, I feel bad for game masters and these, these players like this that 
are kind of a little too hard on themselves because they aren't as good as a as a professional voice actor on the set of a show that has a bunch of people behind it, not not just the ones in front of the camera. Um, so let's let's read this. So this person, Queen Orion, uh, says, "How do I get into character? I'm that type of per- serious slash shy person who has a hard time getting out of my own head to do the voices and." live as my character in the way I want to, and I'm hoping for some tips from the TTRPG family. God, I don't like that tag. Hashtag TTRPG. So, I I, I retweeted it, and I said, you don't have to speak in a voice. It's okay. People shouldn't beat themselves up because they see professional voice actors do it on a stream. It's okay if your game and way of playing doesn't look like theirs. Um... I think that this tweet here, and there's, I bet if you do a search on Twitter, there's a ton of different people that feel this way about uh, their their skills at the table as far as being a dungeon master, a game master, or a player. And um, I'm here to tell you it's okay. Don't beat yourself up. These people at Critical Role, Matt Mercer and, and his friends, are all professional voice actors. They're able to do voices. This is their job. They do it for a living. We do this for fun, right? And most of the time, as a DM, I don't even use silly voices. I think it can be fun sometimes if it fits the character, but I don't generally do it all the time. Um, I more often sort of abstract out what is going on in more cases than not. I do maybe a little bit of 50-50. If I feel I can... I, I usually just talk in my own voice, honestly, and use my own sort of inflections and sort of emotion in my own voice without... That, that already in and of itself is already hard. So trying to do a silly voice on top of all those inflections within my voice is just beyond me. I'm not a voice actor. I can't do it. So if I feel I can do the voice, I'll just use my own voice and speak with them if it feels appropriate. So for instance, most humanoids. But if it's something like a dragon or something like that, I'll abstract it out and say something like, the dragon angrily responds to you with a no. Okay, good. Now, what what do you, the players do, right? So, because I, I'm not capable of making this deep, angry dragon voice, right, that is capable of conveying that, I have to convey it in a more descriptive way. And that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's not going to be as fun for a stream, uh, but I don't stream. I don't like streaming my games. I streamed my Cow Punchers game just to show how the game is played, not because I want to run an actual play sort of of, uh, of show. Because it's just... And, and this is why I don't get watch people that enjoy watching other people play, because I've never found that being just an observer of other people playing role-playing games to be all that fun. But to each their own. But I, I just think that this, this idea that... Um, you have to that 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 here's the thing that bothers me the most about this critical role and a lot of these sort of um actual play productions could easily remedy the situation by telling people look your game is probably not going to look like ours we have awesome terrain and miniatures and we have a whole set lighting we have microphones for everyone a whole production crew behind the camera editors we have um uh all of us that are playing our professional voice actors and we kind of know where the story is going to go and what we should and shouldn't do because i don't personally feel uh like what happens in their game is completely i I think there's some scripted stuff in there some of it is unscripted and and them playing but some of it is is scripted as well and everyone's going along with that so it looks slick and it looks awesome uh but in reality like to do that at your table you would need to have all those same things in order to replicate it which is impossible for you it's impossible for me i don't have the time the energy the desire or the capability of making that happen so these these critical role and people like them could easily come out. Matt Mercer could come out and say, "Look, your game isn't going to look like mine. You don't have the resources this, or or the the acting and experience that we do in order to make this look the way that it looks. 
it's okay that you don't use silly voices. It's okay that you don't do this. Your game isn't going to look like ours. But I never have heard of him saying that. He kind of responded to the Matt Mercer effect by saying like, oh, well, I feel bad for people that, you know, feel this way. But he he didn't really say what I think needed to be said, which is your game is never going to look like ours. Don't try and replicate us. It's like it's it's like being um you, you know, you you play pickup basketball at the, at the local park or something like that and you're like, "Man, our games never look like NBA g- games." Well, it's cuz you guys are all amateurs. You do it in your free time for fun. These people are paid voice actors that do it for money. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just it's a different environment. It's a different situation. And so I I just think that like that there's this way that's been ingrained in our heads. And I think if you come from new school like me, if, if you started, I started in fourth edition and I moved to fifth edition and then over the years realized fifth edition was not my thing and made the switch to OSRs and discovered the whole world of old school D&D and role playing and just fell in love with it. And so one of the most stark things, the most interesting things I discovered is I feel like us that didn't grow up with it in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. We were taught to play wrong in a lot of ways. And I know that that's going to make some people upset. But if you've seen this article here, for instance, of um, why I learned what I learned from breaking up with D&D, and you read this article, I'll have a link to it in the video description as well, you'll, you'll see that it's someone who decided to make this huge MCU-level narrative adventure based off of the 5e starter set and just failed because people at their table had different views and expectations of what the game was going to be the probably long backstories they talk about it in this that's one thing i want to tell you players if i can give you a piece of advice stop with the long backstories we're playing DD. this isn't a creative writing prompt and this isn't a creative writing class Stop with a stop with it, especially if you're starting at level one. There is no need for you to have a three-page backstory. You were a peasant farmer that decided to start adventuring. Your mother and father were killed in an raid, and now you're out seeking revenge and fortune. There, that's your backstory. If it's too long for a tweet, it's too long for your your level one character backstory. That is my personal view. So stop with that. Just knock it off. No one wants to read it. As a DM, I don't want to read that. I don't want to use it. I'm not going to use it, as, as rude and mean as that might sound. I'm just telling you how it is. Like, there's already too much of a burden on the shoulders of a DM or a GM. Trying to give them this, the, you know, five-page backstory, short story of your character and expect them to incorporate, to read it and incorporate that into what they're already trying to construct in their game is a big ask. So... Make it simple for your DM. Do short backstories. Again, my rule of thumb is, if you're starting from level 1, it shouldn't be longer than a tweet. Level 1 to level 5 is your character's backstory, if you survive. And then from then on out, you do the heroic stuff. I think that's the way it's supposed to be, uh, for me personally. That's my personal taste. But if you read this article, they kind of talk about how their relationship with D&D as a DM became toxic. So they try to do this... Uh, grandiose MCU style interlacing narrative. They had seven people at the table, all with different expectations about it. Some wanted to not role play at all. They were not interested in that. Some were more interested in um, deep backstories. They want their three page backstories. And they were also, the article goes on to say, like, they were also not very nice to each other. They tried to do this um, West Marches campaign that failed because the author ended up being the only one, again, that was willing to DM. No one else, even though that was a stipulation of joining this West Marches style campaign, was that other people would DM. Nobody stepped up to the plate except the author. And they, they tried to do this last-ditch campaign in Ravnica. Um, uh, they, that failed. Like and then they just go like, well, it's just it's just that this this relationship's toxic, so it's just the best that I step away. And you know, it's really interesting to me. They they talk about how their first campaign only went six sessions, which is interesting because that's the statistic the statistic I believe that Watsi gives regarding 
um, most of these casual campaigns, how, how long they go for, they mo- mostly don't last beyond uh, six sessions, apparently. And that's interesting that that's where they, they got in a lot of their campaigns before they fell apart here. And, I, and I, I think I've identified why this is. So the narrative game is the new big hot thing. You know, I made a video about random encounters and monster reaction tables and how old school solved the problem a lot of new school players are having. Um, I have a you know, video should be appearing somewhere around here. That they, they felt like combat became a slog. It's just random encounter after random encounter. It's just combat round after combat round. And it's like, well, that's because modern D&D tells you to do random encounters, but they don't always talk about reaction the the players and the characters might have. Reaction rolls in old school D- D&D sometimes give the options of parlaying between potentially hostile groups, right? And so sometimes you can get NPCs on that you encounter that might initially be hostile onto your side. Maybe you just go your separate way, ways. Maybe a trade occurs. There's some role play elements there that can happen. And old school solved that problem. They gave you the random encounter table and said you need to pair it with these reaction rolls. And they're, they need to work together. Modern is just like random encounter, random encounter. And then players made the assumption, I think, and GMs, that it's all combat random encounters. That's what I did as a new player because no one ever told me otherwise. There was no reaction roll. There's nothing in the book, like in one of these, that talks about... or one of these that talks about uh, you know players when they encounter sentient intelligent creatures have the ability to parlay in that way and that reaction rolls should be rolled surprise rolls should be rolled all these other sorts of things should be rolled and these things are totally missing from um, all of this so we were taught to play wrong, I feel like. And so we have these normies, these casual players. That's who's playing D&D, at least 5e. D&D with the D&D logo on it is being played by casual players. They, they are not hardcore fans of this game like you and I are, right? They They like to roll up a character. They like to play and speak in funny voices every once in a while. And then that's it. They're not obsessed with it like a lot of us are. And when you pair that kind of player with selling them the idea that they need to run a game like Critical Role, do you see the disconnect, right? Do you see the the problem there in that it doesn't line up? The, the way you'd run a Critical Role game is if you are obsessed. You are a super fan of the hobby of the game. If you're casual, you will end up like this person here. You will think that it's going to be one thing and it's going to be another and so i think that's why the succession thing happens in a lot of 5e games it seems and i'm not saying every 5e game there's going to be someone in the comments they're typing they've already typed it out and hit enter right now i'm sure i have a 5e game and it's lasted for three years good for you that doesn't change the fact that you're kind of an anomaly in the 5e world so it's okay. It's okay if your game doesn't look like a highly polished production like Critical Role or some, someone else that you admire or watch. It's okay if it doesn't look like that. Play your game. If you're having fun, that's all that matters, right? If everyone at your table is having a good time and having fun and they're not talking in silly voices or something like that, you're not playing your game in any less of a way than anyone else. It's okay. And I really wish that a lot of these 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 personalities within the the streaming community hobby of this would come out and say that a little more. They don't because they rely on their their money making relies on the illusion, I think. And so they can't they can't draw back the curtain and tell you exactly what's going on to make it look the way that it looks. Um So that that's my advice. It's okay. It's okay that your game doesn't look like theirs. I know that seems like simple advice and we ranted for, you know, a good 20 minutes already, but it, it does, I just felt like I needed to talk about this because I saw this tweet and I just like, I, I just see this a lot with people in the hobby right now. And it's, it's unfortunate. 
um, because this kind of person is going to get burnt out because they're going to be overly critical critical of themselves. And it's funny too because you know me and my views. I don't I don't have all the right views uh, in regards to things, and I've been told that I'm a gatekeeper. I think that like this mismatch between what's being sold as the ultimate way to play and the amount of casual players playing D&D right now does more to keep people out of the hobby than gatekeeping ever would. Because they, I've had the accusation, well, if you're a, a jerk and someone has a bad experience, they might never play again. I think the world needs more GMs. And if you keep selling them this idea that they need to run this massive narrative MCU style interconnected story in order to be a good DM, they're going to feel like crap when that doesn't happen and they're never going to want to DM again. And as someone who is a forever GM in a lot of instances, I want more people to be running games so that I have an opportunity to be just be a player. That would be awesome. And I would love to be a player in a very simple game where maybe we're just dungeon crawling. That would be fun because it's fun. It's a, it's just as legitimate of a way to play. It, it's it's interesting to me because I just feel like the narrative style game is a very it can be a very complex and hard game to run. You need to have the right group for it, and you need the right game system for it too. Not saying that D and D in particular, Five E can't do it. I guess people are doing it all the time, but. Something like Vampire the Masquerade or something like that is probably a better game for your narrative-based game than Dungeons & Dragons 5e. So, yeah, that's that's my opinion on it. What is your opinion on it? Do you think that, uh, am I off base, am I wrong, or am I on the money? Let me know. Uh, I Do you think that Critical Role and a lot of these actual play celebrity sort of uh, ways of playing, do you think they've done um, good for the hobby in general or not not saying there's a right or wrong answer here just you know give your opinion in the comment section although the comment section can get kind of crazy so be prepared to to defend yourself in in <laughs> in that regard if you're going to uh say one way or the other but yeah that's that's my opinion i i think that uh there's been a mismatch between the amount of casuals that are playing and what's being sold as how to play properly and it's burning people out. This is how you get. This is how you get these these stories like this, where where someone's breaking up with D and D and talking about the relationship with D and D being toxic. It's because of the 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 metric by which they are measuring themselves or told to measure themselves is, in my opinion, wrong, and will always have this outcome with a majority of casual players. But tell me what you think in the comment section. Interested to know. Tell me what you think about this new format. Is this ugly? Is this... I can change it. I'm just trying to figure out a way of being on camera but also showing my screen when I'm looking at articles or tweets or things like this as well when we're, when we're covering something relevant to this. So <clears throat> until next time, guys, I'll catch you in the next video. The video on Monday that is coming out is going to be me and how my... GM prep has changed. I made a video, one of my first videos I made, how I was going to run a basic fantasy sandbox style game. And so this is going to be kind of an, this video on Monday is going to be kind of an update on it as I've been running the game and what things have I had to change. So again, make sure you check out the links, check out Gods of the Forbidden North, check out Libra Online, check out my uh, subscribe star if you're interested in supporting me in that way. And until next time, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.